He is a very well-known researcher in meteorological and atmospheric science circles, works a lot these days on cloud physics and what clouds and, uh, do to climate change uh, uh, with respect to various atmospheric phenomena. But he also has long-standing interests that he's developed over the last several years in climate change coming from a much more human perspective, I suppose. And today, he's going to address that. His title is a fascinating one. Now, keep in mind that he is an atmospheric physicist. But his title, as you can see, is, Is it possible to decouple economic wealth from carbon dioxide emission rates? Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, Tom. So, so my title is, uh, yes, is it possible to decouple economic wealth from carbon dioxide emission rates? And this has uh, led to a paper that, question that led to a paper that appeared in Climatic Change. Um, it's still just online, it's not in print, but it's online at the Climatic Change website, um, entitled, Are There Basic Physical Constraints on Future Anthropogenic Emissions of Carbon Dioxide? And in the article, conclusions are perhaps some that are a little bit, uh, I suppose provocative, but um, among them are that perhaps contrary to popular belief, improving energy efficiency actually leads to accelerated uh, carbon dioxide emissions growth rather than reduced carbon dioxide emissions growth. And also, absent collapsing the economy, in other words, turning the inflation adjusted GDP to zero, um, emissions can only be stabilized by building the equivalent of about one nuclear power plant per day globally. And perhaps because um, that seems, both of those things seem somewhat improbable, uh, civilization has inertia. And its present state and its present growth rate are determined by the past. And the past fundamentally cannot be changed. So we are set on a trajectory that perhaps can lead to simplified predictions of the future. But really, I mean, what this, how this started off was just a simple question of, I think maybe a question many of us have asked, which is, where does the value of money come from? Um, you know, all of us, perhaps I shouldn't be asking that, I'm not, I have no background in economic sciences, but we all have perhaps more field experience in the economic world than we have in any other profession that we might have. I may be a cloud physicist, but I certainly have more field experience in the economic world uh, just buying stuff on a daily basis. And I think it's just an intuitive question. We have this thing called money, and you know, it's just a piece of paper, and it seems to be able to do stuff. I mean, with money, you can do almost anything if you have enough of it. And it's, there's no restriction on, there isn't a different type of money for different types of things. And yeah, I mean, where, where does this value come from? An economist would say that it's fundamentally, I think, belief-based, that I believe it has value, you believe it has value, and therefore it has value. But I think coming from a physics background, that's, well, that may be true, um, probably almost certainly is true, but it's a bit under, unsatisfactory of an explanation because it doesn't really explain where the belief comes from. Why is that belief so resilient? Presumably, the belief has some representation that can be explained physically, since civilization certainly is part of the physical universe. It's not separate from it. We are all part of the physical world. So I had this hunch, you know, I could call it a hypothesis, but that really sounds a bit more formal, since this was really just an armchair philosophical question. But the hunch was that maybe civilization can be considered to be just an organism, like any other organism. And as an organism, it can be defined physically, where physics is about the transformation of energy from one state to another. There are basic laws of thermodynamics. And fundamentally, physics is about uh, the transfer of energy, or really the flow of energy downhill, or more strictly, the flow of material downhill from a high potential state to a low potential state. So you can just think of a ball rolling from a high gravitational potential to a low gravitational potential. And, and you could think, well, stuff happens in civilization. So that's perhaps what we value, is the stuff happening. So perhaps maybe that money is simply a representation of some energetic flow from high potential to low potential. It's just a, very simple, intuitive argument that perhaps economic wealth 
that money is a representation of a rate of consumption of energy. And I think it's an intuitive idea. And, you know, perhaps I could uh, take something from the recent news, which was, was this Wood Buffalo National Park that was coming from? Uh, I think, you know, a beaver dam is perhaps, you know, a nice analogy for, we talk about beaverdom and beaverdom having its own version of civilization. But in this case, I mean, what I was trying to develop was actually a thermodynamic explanation. I won't go into the details of the thermodynamics or in the article that's published online. But... Uh, you can think of a beaver dam, well, it has its own sort of representation of civilization. And what's the size of beaver civilization? Well, you can think of civilization in the case of a beaver being represented by um, some potential difference right here between a high gravitational potential and a low gravitational potential. And there's an energy reservoir behind it. But really, for the beavers, you could measure the size of the civilization for the beavers by a flow of water across this potential difference. Where the total flow of water is this potential difference right here times the length of the beaver dam, which in this case was 835 meters apparently. So longest in the world. So perhaps we could think of something similar. I mean, this is rather abstract, but we could perhaps think of something similar applying to uh, human civilization. Um, you know, of course, if human civilization might be more difficult to conceive as being a uh, line, but the thought was that civilization perhaps represents a gradient between available energy supplies, which in our case would represent things like coal, oil, and uranium, and a point of low potential, which in our case would probably be outer space. Well, probably with the beavers too, ultimately. Because we consume energy things happen in civilization due to the flow across that potential gradient. And ultimately, there's waste heat that's released, and that gets radiated to outer space at a cold temperature of about 255 Kelvin. So coming back to this hunch. So this is the hunch is that there's a physics is about energy transformation. So maybe we can treat civilization as a physical entity, as a single organism that interacts on a global scale with available energy reservoirs. And through the transformation of that energy reservoir, it, um, that energy, it does stuff. And money, the value of money, is a representation of that capacity to do stuff physically. So, I mean, we can test this. This is a testable hypothesis. And it can be expressed mathematically, which means that we can look at this quantifiably. But the idea here is just simply that we have a rate of energy consumption. I gave it the symbol A because it's available energy. So there's a rate of energy consumption. So this would have units of perhaps watts, if you wanted to think of it this way, on a global scale. And then we have something called wealth. And wealth would have units of currency. And here it's adjusted for inflation. And then the hypothesis is just that these two quantities are related through a constant that does not change over time. That's a testable hypothesis. Now, the problem here is, what, what is wealth? And I think, you know, you can think of this with the beavers or with the hus. Wealth is obviously something that I think has accumulated over time. The beavers started off with something small, and then based on what we currently have, we are able to grow what we currently have to produce more that adds to what we currently have, which then gives us more power to produce more in the future. And it's through this positive feedback that civilization or a beaver dam is able to grow. And then, so the question then is, well, how would you uh, calculate wealth? And I mean, I was entirely naive in this. I think economists, I don't know what economists do, but they do something a bit different here. But they, the idea was simply to take, well, I don't know, let's see, what's wealth? Uh, I don't know, as a guess, um, the statistics for global GDP. In fact, there's some statistics going rather far back in time I can use. And take these statistics for global GDP, adjust them for inflation, seems like a sensible thing to do, and just add up all the economic production from the beginning of history, civilization, up to the present, and that will give us our wealth. So GDP has units of currency per time, so it's a production per year. And you think, well, production is producing real production, inflation adjusted production is producing something new that adds to what we currently have, and that added over time creates our wealth. And hypothesis is that's related to our rate of energy consumption, 
through a constant value. So we've got statistics that can be used to test this hypothesis. There are um, GDP statistics available from the United Nations since the United 1970 that are adjusted for inflation to 1990 equivalent US dollars. And then there's some historical world GDP estimates since 1 AD. Now they're quite far back, they're quite sparse going back in time. I mean, the first one's 1 AD and then 1000 AD, then 1500. And they're probably quite uncertain. Um, so when doing the integral, that, that you could think that's going to provide some source of uncertainty in the total calculation of wealth. However, fortunately, um, the GDP today is so immensely larger than it was way back in history that the uncertainty is actually, is, is relatively insensitive, the total calculation, to the calculations way back in time. And I, you know, I did some tests on what that might be. Uh, and then they have global primary energy production statistics since 1970. So this is the total consumption of energy by civilization as a whole in uh, terms of uh, uranium, oil, coal, whatever. And then we have CO2 emission statistics from CDISE, where the, uh, ultimately I'm going to try to compare this to carbon dioxide emissions. So uh, I will show a graph for this, but first I'll start off with a table. The nice thing was, was that this hypothesis actually turns out to be supported by the data to an extremely high degree of confidence. The uncertainty, is, the value turns out to be 9.7 milliwatts per 1990 US dollar. So every US dollar is, has, what turns that piece of paper into something that has a potential to do something is 9.7 milliwatts of continuous energy consumption. And to, just to show some numbers that I just chose, you know, well, they're decades, and I chose the most recent for which I have statistics. Here are the global energy consumption uh, rates in terawatts, starting at 7.2 in 1970, going up to close to 16 terawatts in 2007. And here's the economic wealth. That's that time integral I showed. And that's gone up from $821 trillion dollars Nine, um, in 1970, 1990 dollars to 1620 in 2007. And the ratio of these two quantities has re uh, remained roughly constant over time. And so this is the uncertainty in the mean. So it's not the standard deviation, it's just the uncertainty in the mean, uh, adjusted for things like autocorrelation of the time series. So you can see here that you know, there's some variation Perhaps that's due to uncertainties in the estimates, calculations, but it's relatively constant. 